Well, hello, everybody. Uh, we're going to be looking at Frege, and we have uh, Professor Michael Potter joining us again. Um, to, we've talked about Wittgenstein before, we've talked about Ramsey before, and today is, is Frege. So just to give you an idea of what's going to be happening, uh, we're going to be doing this interview in three parts. Um, today we're going to be doing um, a bit of a biography of Frege and looking at some of the earlier years of his career. So we're going to look at the publication of Begriffschrift in 1879. We're going to be looking at what logic was like before that date, uh, Aristotle and the Stoics. Uh, we're going to be looking at his anti-psychologism, uh, what that means, um, because that's a theme in uh, early analytic philosophy. We're going to then look at Frege's act-content distinction, uh, what quantifiers and scope are in his logic. And then we're going to look at his first major work, um, the Begriffschrift, and in particular, one section that um, Professor Potter believes has the most important paragraph and the whole of philosophy in it. We're going to look at what that was, what a major difference that made to the way we understood philosophy and our methodology for it. And then we're going to end things there for the next time. So, so keep watching the channel for the next one. It'll be out soon. Uh, next time we're going to look at Frege's Grundlagen der Arithmetik or Foundations of Arithmetic in English. Um, which is a, more of a philosophical book uh, about uh, logic and mathematics. And we're going to take our time. It's a very, very interesting book. So the entire conversation will be on that work. And then we're going to have a third conversation where we'll look at uh, Frege's sense and reference distinction, uh, the impact of that in terms of his philosophy of language. We're then going to look at the basic laws of arithmetic, where Frege tries to prove his uh, logicism project. Um, and then look at Russell's paradox and the devastation that that wrought, and then end on some of the enduring input pack that Frege has had on philosophy. So lots of really interesting goodness to come, um, starting over here now, and then and then two more sessions. Now, just before I ask my first question, um, I should just remind you that Professor Michael Potter has uh, this book out from 2020, um, The Rise of Analytic Philosophy, 1879 to 1930. So if you're paying really close attention, you might notice that 1879 was an important date as far as Frege is concerned. We're going to find out a bit more about that too. And if you don't know what Frege's logical language looks like, there's also an image of it on the front of the book. Um, that is Frege's Begriffschrift notation on the front cover. So we'll find out why he's chosen that for the front cover rather than anything from uh, Russell Wittgenstein or Ramsey. But this book goes into everything about the early analytic philosophers. So uh, deep dive into uh, Frege, Russell, Wittgenstein and Ramsey, of course. There's even a little section on Bradley there too for you Bradley fans. Um, so that's that's what is to come. All right, let's get into it. Um, so so Michael, I think, I think with any philosopher, when I want to sort of really understand them, the first thing I tend to do, and ironically, the, a vast chunk of the, the Bynum version of Begriffschrift involves, uh, has a biography about Frege. So can you tell me a little bit about Frege himself? Yes, and it will only be a little bit. Um, there's a fair bit known about his life, but basically his life wasn't very interesting. <laughs> and I do think there are some philosophers whose life really is important to understanding the work and others where it's less so. So I think, for example, Wittgenstein, you just can't, well, partly bit, the way that Tractatus was written is just so incredible, you know, writing a book the way he did during the First World War. But it, but also just the way the book's written, its structure partly depends on how it came to be written. So that's an example where I think biography and pure history of philosophy just kind of are intermeshed. Whereas with Frege, really, the biography is almost independent of the work. I mean, he he was born in 1848 in Wismar, a port on the north coast of what's now Germany, was then Prussia. Um, he um, was the son of a headmaster of a school who died when he was quite young. His mother carried on with the school. He, Frege, then went to university in Jena, and then went on to do a doctorate at Göttingen, which was one of the leading universities for mathematics at the time. And it's worth mentioning, of course, that 
his training was in mathematics. I mean, he did a couple of philosophy courses as a student, but he was a mathematician. Uh, and then after Goethe, he went back to Jena, where he'd been a student, and he spent the rest of his professional life in the mathematics department at Jena. And then, then he retired um, uh, to Bad Kleinen, which is um, not that far away from Jena. So, you know, not a very eventful life. Um, he um, had an adopted son um, uh, called Alfred. Um, mm -hmm. And what else is interesting about him? Well, he had a few visits from Wittgenstein um, just before the First World War. We don't know exactly how many, but, you know, a few, three or four. Um, and he carried on writing, exchanging letters with Wittgenstein during the First World War. Um, Wittgenstein always had a huge respect for Frege, greater than his respect for anyone else. Um, so clearly that interaction, even though it was quite limited, had a big effect on, on Wittgenstein. But apart from that, Frege didn't really interact with other people very much. He had a famous correspondence with Hilbert, um, which we could do another talk about sometime yeah. if you wanted to. But he never met Hilbert. Oh, sorry, did I he? So. I think he did once, but oh, I should check that. Um, but certainly in one of the letters, Hilbert said to Frege, rather than exchanging letters, why don't we just meet and talk about this? And Hilbert actually said something like, you know, with modern train travel, it's really quite easy. You could come and visit me. But Frege never did. Um, so, you know, I think Frege was rather introverted. So the, the few accounts we have of him suggest that. Um, there's a lovely account of him giving lectures where apparently he would spend the entire lecture with his face to the board, just writing on the board, but would occasionally, in a more extrovert moment, half turn his head round and say something directed to the audience and then turn back to the to the, to the board. So, you know, that's the the impression one gets of the kind of kind of person he was. Yeah, I remember reading a description of someone who met him and, and he's apparently quite a short chap. Is that right? And uh, quite, quite sort of furtive and fidgety by, by, this, by the description that was given. I think some of the other bits that jumped out to me were, now correct me if I'm wrong on this, Alfred was actually a, a nephew or something, wasn't he, whose parents died? Is that right? Uh, I think a cousin, cousin rather than a, uh, was it a bit more di distant than nephew, yeah. Right, right. But it was related, yeah. Yeah, related. Because did he marry? Did Frege marry? Uh, he married. He, his wife died in 1904. And that clearly had an effect on him. He certainly suffered from depression later in life. Some people say that, oh, the depression would have been caused by Russell's paradox and him discovering that his life's work was in ruins. But my own view is <laughs> the death of his wife is quite sufficient to explain the depression. Yeah. You know, don't need to add the extra explanation of Russell's paradox. Yeah, I've read that because he doesn't write anything for about 10 years, isn't it? That's right, isn't it? Yeah, so he has this sort of gap. Um, did they have any children? Um, s some accounts say they had a couple of children who died in infancy, but I'm not sure whether I've seen good evidence of that. I don't know. Mm. But anyway, he certainly didn't have any children of his own who lived. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah, I, yeah, I remember. There, and there's certainly parts of his letters that made me feel a bit sorry for him on, on Russell's paradox being discovered. Um, he seems actually quite unusually quick to recognize how devastating it really was to, to what he said. Maybe we'll, maybe that's better gone into on the third session. I don't know. But um, um, I certainly ooh, felt felt sorry for him in the letter. Oh, yeah. um, and sorry. of course, I mean, he's, he's extremely famous now. Um, how sort of uh, famous or recognized was he in his lifetime for his work? Uh not completely unknown. I think people like Russell liked, liked the story. I mean, particularly Russell, he liked stories which had really black and white contrast. So on Russell's account, you know, Frege died completely um, unrecognised. Uh, that's not quite true. Um, for example, by the time he was he died, people like, well, certainly, I mean, Wittgenstein had, had mentioned him in the preface to the Tractatus, for example, um, and um, others were beginning to 
take his work seriously. But it's true that most of the recognition came after he died. And it's also true that he was embittered by the lack of recognition he got. Mm. In particular, he mentions in his in letters that his first book, Begriffschrift, um, or Conceptual Notation in English, um, hasn't received the attention that he thinks it merits. So you know, it's clear he was aware as soon as he published Begriffschrift that it was important. And he was frustrated by the fact that other people didn't seem to recognise that. Hmm. So 1879 is the date that it's published, and that's also the date that you begin, uh, or you, you mention the title of your book uh, as being the start of the period you're uh, looking at. So maybe could you tell me a little bit about Begriffschrift and what it was and some of the sort of biography around its publication, how it was received and what it was speaking to and that sort of thing? Yes. Um, well, one thing to say is, I think we, when we were talking earlier, you mentioned the suggestion that parts of the book Begriffschrift betray a sense of hurry, a sense of the book being a little bit rough around the edges. Yeah. Um, and it certainly ends <laughs> just kind of, you think you want to turn the page. Is that how the book ends? It ends in a very offbeat kind of way. And I think part of that is he just wanted a book for a reason that people like you, I'm sure, can Simplized, which which was he wanted a job. He yeah. he didn't yet have a permanent job at um, at Jena, so he he rushed it the book out. Um, he may have been worried about other people getting credit for this big exciting idea he had. He wanted to get it out there before anyone else trumped him. Um, and in fact, there were a couple of other people. Purse in America had some ideas around that time, which are similar to some of. Fregas. So, you know, he, he probably was right to get it out there to establish some priority. But what's interesting is that although there is that sense of the book being rough around the edges, it contains several really, really important ideas in how to think about logic, where he gets them, I think, right first time. And the way to be really have it brought on you vividly how important that is is to see how Russell, writing um, twenty years later, got most of these points wrong. Um, so when Russell writes his book, The Principles of Mathematics, Russell by then is starting to learn from Frege, um, but Russell quite often just misses the significance of Frege's ideas. Mm -hmm. um, Russell had a copy of Begriffschrift, which he was given by his um, former supervisor at Cambridge, Ward. And Ward had this copy, so it's kind of, this book might interest you, I haven't really taken it seriously, but he gave it to Russell. And Russell just kind of seems to have skimmed it and thought, oh, no big deal. And it took Russell quite a few years to realise how much of what Russell was thinking about had already been thought about by by Frege. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the kind of the reason why it's so, I think, 1879 is such an important date. Frege manages to get not everything right, but he gets a remarkable, a remarkable amount right first time. Um, and, and perhaps the way to explain that is to go back, you know, back a step and think, what was the logic like before 1879? And the answer is that there were two traditions in logic which date right back to the ancient Greeks. There was an Aristotelian tradition and there was a Stoic tradition. And basically, the Stoic tradition was developing what we now think of as propositional calculus, truth functional, if P then Q, kind of P and Q, P or Q, that stuff. Yeah, and so just for people who are not so familiar, this is where we we're only really dealing at the level of sentences, aren't we, or, or, or propositions or claims. All we care about is whether they're true or false, and we're looking at something to do with how that truth and falsity interact. We don't have any way of talking about objects and their properties or similar things in within sentences. Yeah, exactly so. That's the Stoic tradition. 
And then the second tradition, the Aristotelian one, looks at arguments, so-called syllogistic arguments, like um, all bachelors are men, all men are mortal, therefore all bachelors are mortal. That's the standard example of an Aristotelian syllogism. Now, Aristotle had studied the various kinds of syllogism and their relationships and had a quite sophisticated logic of how they're related. But the key thing about the Aristotelian syllogism is that no one had succeeded in uniting it and the Stoic stuff into one system. So it was as if logic was really two two things. There was Aristotelian logic, there was Stoic logic, and there were, so there were two different ways of modelling how we reason, and no one had worked out convincingly how to put them together into one unified package. Yeah. And now the other thing that no one had succeeded in doing was to work out um, how these um, words, all and some, which are used in the Aristotelian logic, to work out fully how they're related to one another. And the biggest idea in Begriffschrift, although I say there are several big ideas, the biggest idea is Frege's idea that what these words all and some do is that they're what's nowadays called quantifiers and that what a quantifier does is it acts as a kind of scope marker in a sentence in such a way that where the word all or some occurs in the sentence needn't be where the predicating action in the sentence occurs. So what I mean by that is, take a sentence like, every man respects some teacher. Okay? So we've got a quantifier, every, every man, and we've got another quantifier, some, as in some teacher. Now the thing to see is that that sentence is ambiguous between two readings. But there's one reading on which each man has a particular teacher that that man respects. The second reading is that there's one teacher such that every man respects that same, that one, you know, highly respected teacher. Mm -hmm. Now, what Frege did was he found a notation that allows you to represent both those readings of the ambiguous English sentence, where what you do is you mark the position in the sentence where the predicating action is occurring, and you mark the position where the quantifier is occurring, and you link those two positions, and the two positions can be in different places in the sentence. So, sorry, that's all a bit elaborate, but so go back to our example. Suppose I say it more fully. Every man is such that some teacher is such that the former respects the latter. That's one reading. The other reading is some teacher is such that every man is such that the latter respects the former. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Now, that's all in English. And notice that there, in expanding it, I had to use the words former and latter. Okay. Now, the words former and latter are the technical term in grammar is they're called anaphoric. Anaphoric being the Greek word for looking back. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that the reference of the word former and the reference of the word latter, to find out what those references are, you have to look back earlier to find out what's being talked about already. Mm -hmm. So the former and latter don't work on their own as having meanings. Their meanings depend on what you've already said you're talking about. And why is it important to distinguish between those two different claims as far as logic goes? Um, it's what, it's, it's astonishing. It's what makes logic non-trivial. Um, 
By the way, I mean, the word trivial, trivial there, you know the etymology of trivial? No. Um, it comes from trivium. Um, the medieval liberal arts education in medieval European universities hmm. had seven subjects in it. There were three subjects in, as it were, part one and four subjects in part two. And so the subjects in part one were called the trivium from the Latin for three. Right. Part two was called the quadrivium from the word for four. So trivial, the etymology is, it's the subject you did in part one. So the easy things. Hmm. Right? And logic was, was one of the trivium. Right. So logic was an easy thing. But the logic we're talking about was this Aristotelian syllogistic logic. Yeah. Now, this is where I really ought to have a blackboard, but, but the point is that there's a technical result in logic, which is that if you just do Aristotelian syllogistic logic, which can be expressed using the, these words like every and some, but where you don't need variables, because in Aristotelian syllogism, you don't need to have the scopes of the different quantifiers overlapping and inter interacting with each other. So you don't need this complicated machinery of linking argument places to quantifiers. That's the sense in which Aristotelian logic's trivial. And the precise way of expressing that is that it's mechanically decidable. So you can write a computer program which will mechanically decide for any Aristotelian syllogism, whether it's valid or not. If you try to write a computer program that does the same for Frege's logic, where you've got these linkages between argument places and quantifiers, it turns out there is a result which wasn't actually proved until after Frege had died, but there's a technical result um, called the church turing undecidability theorem, which says that no computer program can do that. Mm, so for any computer program that you try to write, there'll be a Phrygian logical argument, which if you input that argument into your computer program and press enter, the computer will simply go on running forever. It will never stop. Right? Yes. Yeah. So you can write a computer program which will, which will be able to solve some logical problems, and you can write a program which will never lie to you, it'll never give you the wrong answer, but you can't write a program which will always stop with the answer yes or no reliably. Right, okay. okay. So that's a precise logical result that says Phrygian logic is really non-trivial, where the previous logic was trivial. Okay. And it's that, although Frege didn't know that result because I say it wasn't proved until after he died, I'm, there are places where Frege writes, even already in Begriffschrift, about the power of logic, which make one think that he had a sense of that result. I mean, he wouldn't have expressed it in terms of the mechanical, but he had a sense that logic was now powerful in a way that logic hadn't been before 1879. And he had a sense of how important that was for philosophy. I mean, one example of how important it is, is that it just, at a stroke, makes rationalism into a different kind of thing. You know, rationalism is the idea that just by thinking, just sitting in your armchair, you can reason and you can find out things about um, the world around you. Now, if in your armchair as, you, as a rationalist, the tools available to you are only Aristotelian tools and Stoic tools, then it's reasonable to ask, well, how can those tools deliver anything non-trivial, any non-trivial results about your environment or about thought? Whereas once you've got Phrygian logic, that whole question becomes moot again. You have to start again and think, well, with these tools, maybe I can produce non-trivial consequences for thought just from my armchair, just by thinking. 
So that's just one example of a philosophical problem, which is just reconfigured once you you're in the post Phrygian world. Right. Okay. That's very interesting. I didn't know we were going to go there. So I, I had a couple of little questions on that. Um, <clears throat> so just for the sake of my of the listeners, obviously, even Aristotelian syllogism, if you said uh, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, Socrates is mortal or something of that sort, that obviously doesn't follow if we're just talking about truth and falsity of sentences and truth functional logic because they're different sentences. It seems to be something to do with objects and properties. So that's why the Aristotelian and Stoic tradition don't mesh. So one little question then on, on Aristotle, <clears throat> obviously the difference between your teacher example or the everybody loves someone example is somewhere in some cases, one could be true. One reading would be true and the other reading would be false. So if everybody, there was a person they loved, it wasn't always the same person. If the claim was that, that it was the same person that everybody loved, that would be false. Okay. So if Aristotle didn't have the, the scope uh, tools, was there any way to know, to distinguish between the truth and falsity of the two different readings in Aristotle? No. So in, in Aristotelian syllogism, those examples just don't count as, examples that involve two quantifiers in that kind of way just don't count as syllogisms. Now, I mean, there's one slight point here, which is there's a tendency nowadays, because logic after, after 1879 is so different from logic before it, there aren't actually that many people who study medieval logic very much. It's a, it's a wonderful, rich subject, but it's quite regarded as quite a niche area these days. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's load, there was loads going on in medieval logic. And one of the intriguing things is medieval logicians did study things like every, every, every man respects some teacher. And they recognized ambiguities. And they were very, very close, some of them, to to some of the Phrygian discoveries, but they just kept <laughs> veering away, you know, just going in a different direction. Um, so they had a quite elaborate theory of what they call supposition, which is the manner in which terms refer to their references. And so they had quite elaborate theories of the difference between saying, um, uh, every and each, for example. Um, but the very fact that these theories were so elaborate is because they never found the unifying treatment because they never really got the Phrygian notion of scope. So they talked about things like the order in which things arrive in the sentence. Well, what's that mean? Well, Frege explained it. It's a matter of yeah. scope. Hmm. Um, and then once you've got that Phrygian notion of scope, you can use it in ways that Frege himself didn't use it. So, for example, for Frege, the notion of scope he was interested in was scope of quantifiers in relation either to other quantifiers or to the true functional things we were talking about, the Stoic things. So Frege was aware of how the quantifiers all and some interact with negation, conjunction, disjunction, you know, these, the, the, the um, truth functional things. Frege didn't look at how they interact, how these quantifiers interact with what we now call propositional attitudes, like belief. Um, but Russell did, and Russell realized that you can use quantifiers to explain scope ambiguities with belief. So, for example, take John believes that every raven at the Tower of London is black. Well, there are at least two readings of that. One is with the quantifier out the front, the so-called de re reading, which is every raven at the Tower of London is such that John believes that it is black. So that means that, as it were, he's gone round all eight ravens at the Tower of London one by one. Yep, that one's black, that one's black, that one's black. Right, that's De Re. The other reading, John believes that all the ravens at the Tower of London, whatever, whatever they are, however many of them there are, are black. And he might believe that not because he's looked at all eight ravens at the Tower of London, 
but he might believe wrongly as it happens that all Romans are black. Hmm. Okay, so that they're completely different ways of arriving at belief. They're different kinds of belief. That's being say is is controversial, but that's my view of it anyway. The 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 so called de dicto belief is a different kind of believing from a de re belief. Hmm. Um, now that de re de dicto distinction, medieval logicians had, but they haven't found a way of connecting it to quantifier and variable. Hmm. Once you've got Frege's tools for expressing it, you can express that in terms of the order of the quantifier and the belief operator. They're just different orders. Okay, fantastic. So let me just quickly summarize what uh, I understand you saying. So there was this one kind of logic with the Stoic tradition, which just involved truth or falsity and sentences and other kinds of logical um, uh, constants like and or not. And you can look at arguments that are valid uh, on that basis. Uh, but then you have the Aristotelian tradition, which had something to do with quantifiers. It involved things like all and some and and of that sort. But it was messy, a little bit complicated, and it didn't link in with the Stoic tradition. And then Frege comes along and creates a logic that has is able to do everything the Stoic tradition can do, everything the Aristotelian condition to do, and more. And it can start to pull apart these other ambiguities. Is, is that right so far? Yeah. But Frege was interested in what we do when we do logic, which is how much is logic related to psychology. Can you talk a little bit about what the debates were at that time and what Frege's trying to show? Yes. Um, Frege is famous as the most ardent anti-psychologist about logic. And he was so ardent in it that lots of people nowadays think Frege invented anti-psychologism about logic. In fact, he didn't. Um, it's explicit in Kant, for example. Kant was an anti-psychologist about logic. And indeed, the, the thread of anti-psychologism that, that Frege expressed so vehemently actually went from Kant via a 19th century philosopher called Herbart that no one nowadays reads. Um, and what Herbart did was Herbert took Frege's, sorry, took Kant's claim that logic isn't psychology. And Herbert used that to motivate a very interesting distinction, the so-called act content distinction. So the idea was that when we have a thought, we're doing something psychological. But the content of our thought is, if you agree with Kant's antipsychologistic claim, linked to the contents of other thoughts in ways that don't depend on our mind. So the idea is Kant's trying to get at some sense of how the necessity of logic isn't to be explained normatively in terms of how we actually think. It's that these thoughts, the contents of these thoughts just are related to each other and the normativity derives from those relationships. So we ought to think in certain ways because the thoughts, the, the contents of our thoughts just are related in these ways. Therefore, if we don't match the ways that they're related in the ways that we reason, We'll go wrong. So that's the direction which the Kantian um, argument's supposed to go. So Herbart thought the right way to explain that is to make a distinction between the act of thinking and the content that's being thought. So if I uh, express something, I might make an assertion. I might, I might say, you know, I might make a claim like that it's sunny today. Well, Herbert said you should distinguish between the content, which is that it's sunny today, and the act of thinking or claiming that it's sunny today. Now, as I said, that's Herbert, and Herbert said this, and not that many people paid that much attention to it. Frege read Herbert, Frege did take, pay attention to it, so in Begriffsschrift, 
Frege makes a very central use of that distinction and he builds it into his notation. So this is another of Frege's innovations. I've already we've already talked about the quantifier variable thing, the the linking argument places to quantifiers. But this second innovation was Frege introduced a sign to express the notion of asserting something. And in his formal way of writing um, assertions, there's this sign at the front, and then there's an expression for the content being asserted. So Frege builds this at content distinction into his notation for logic. And that enables Frege to make a distinction between two ways in which a content or a proposition, as we now tend to call it, can occur in arguments. It can occur unasserted or it can occur asserted. So the idea is that if I say it's sunny today, then it's occurring, the, the content that it's sunny today is occurring asserted. But if I say, if it's sunny today, then I don't need to take my umbrella. Then in that sentence, the, the, the content, it's sunny today, occurs as a subpart of a bigger sentence. And I could say that without committing myself to it's being sunny today. Because I could say, if it's sunny today, I don't need my umbrella, even if I think it's raining today, because I've just said, well, if it's sunny today, I don't need, right? So we need this distinction between occurrences asserted and occurrences unasserted. But, and this is the place where it becomes a bit controversial, but at least Frege thought, and many people agree with them, you need there to be a single content that occurs both in the asserted cases and the unasserted cases. Because Frege thought, if you can't say that there's a single content in common between those two, you won't be able to explain how modus ponens works. Modus ponens being the, the rule that from it's sunny today and if it's sunny today, then I don't need my umbrella, we can deduce I don't need my umbrella. So Frege's idea is in that argument, the single content, it's sunny today, occurs in one premise asserted and in the other pr premise unasserted. Hmm. And so Frege used that as an argument to motivate distinguishing um, the two kinds of case. So if we were going to sort of summarize how uh, his anti-psychologism um, is related to this because people won't know what's really at stake here with the debate of whether logic is psychology or whether the content of our thoughts is somehow uh, mind independent. I mean, is that a good word to use, do you think, for psychologism? So the, the idea would be that the psychologists say that inference is what, just something we do in our minds, has no kind of objectivity to it. What, what's philosophically at stake in this debate and who won? Um, in the 20th century, Frege won. Um, whether he should have won is another matter. Um, the, the curious case is Russell, because Russell became as clear an anti-psychologist as Frege, but then Russell suddenly changed his mind. Um, um, towards the end of the First World War, he flipped to become um, a psychologist about logic. Um, and he started a research project um, in 1918, which he carried on for a few years, where he attempted um, a kind of behaviorist or pra pragmatist account of language, including logic in that account. Um, he didn't develop it fully. I'm not at all convinced it works. I think there are enormous challenges involved in psychologism. I think psychologism 
at least in its unsophisticated form, is implausible because what it's saying is that the correctness of logical inferences or the incorrectness of logical inferences is to be explained at the level of human psychology. So it's a generalization about how we actually reason rather than about how we ought to reason if we aim at truth. So the way that Frege put it was that Frege said, if we reason in certain ways, that's there's a question you can ask about whether we are right to do so. And the answer to that question is different from the answer to the question whether we all do it all the time or most of us do it most of the time. So he thought it was just clear to him that it's not just an empirical generalization about how humans actually reason. Frege thought it was at least comprehensible that there might be some rule that humans use quite generally, that perhaps all humans have used throughout human history, but which we might then discover was mistaken. Frege thought it was at least comprehensible that that could happen, whereas the psychologist has to have an account where there's no room for that possibility. Because if that is how we all reason, then a psychologist will note that as a well-confirmed generalization about human reasoning. Hmm. That, that doesn't allow the possibility that there might be an undetected error there. Hmm. And do you think that also might um, be be of interest to the rationalism empiricist uh, question as well? Because if, if uh, what we reason is... Uh, through, through psychological, then that almost sounds as though it's an, an empirical matter as well to determine how we happen to reason. Um, and then that becomes the basis of our logic. Yeah, that's how right. Okay. Yeah. And the thing is, these are complicated issues because, of course, the anti-psychologist has, of course, to acknowledge that reasoning is, is a human activity. It's a distinctively human activity that involves the way the human mind is configured and that if human minds were configured differently, no doubt there would be ways in which human reasoning would be different. So the subtlety of it is to get an account of logic which recognizes fully that logic is an activity that humans do, not a, an activity that lions do, um, so builds in the human particularity of logic, but for the anti-psychologist can still leave room for the idea that there's an element of it which doesn't depend on humans. So roughly the, the idea has to be that once you've built in the human dependent elements, in recognizing that language is a human activity structured um, in ways that can be partially explained in evolutionary terms, for example. Once you build that in, the anti-psychologist wants to claim, then given that assumption, there's another bit that isn't a matter of convention, isn't up to us, that just has to be that way. Given that bedrock, we have no choice in the matter that some things just follow from other things, some, you know, some consequences follow from some premises, other consequences just don't follow. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. how much we think they do, we can just be wrong about that. Yes, yeah, so this is a matter of fact about right and wrong reasoning, and it's not a contingent matter, you know, using other terminology. Okay, yeah, one more thing on this, because I know we need to get on to um, the most important paragraph in philosophy. Um, but just before we do, because prefigure a little bit where, where we'll talk about more in depth later. But obviously, with Frege's project being to demonstrate that um, arithmetic is a first step, but then then mathematics more generally uh, is built on logical principles, then the status of logic would have a lot to say about the status of mathematics. And I suppose, um, at least nowadays, and a lot of people are 
almost reducing physics to mathematics and seeing how important mathematics is in terms of explaining a structure in the world. Um, that would play into other ideas about the basis of the world. How much is related to psychology? How much is independent? And then probably in, well, in Frege's time and around that century, there are questions about, are we exploring the mind of God or Plato's space or the third realm? Is it maybe just say something a little bit about about that now so they can see how this is this question of psychologism will interact with Frege's broader project and metaphysical questions. Yes, uh, of course, because Frege had that anti-psychologistic view of logic and thought that mathematics was, in a sense, part of logic, sorry, that arithmetic was part of logic, not mathematics. He had a different view about geometry, but yeah. he thought arithmetic was um, derived from logic, it follows that he thought that arithmetic was equally anti-psychologistic. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is he also thought that arithmetic inherited its non-triviality from the non-triviality of logic. So um, Frege thought that well, Frege knew, because Frege was a mathematician, that arithmetic is non-trivial, that we have problems like Goldbach's conjecture, which are very simple to state. Goldbach's conjecture is a claim about numbers, that every even number greater than two is the sum of two primes. So it's very quick to state, but we still don't know whether it's true or false. So there's a sense in which it's a non-trivial problem in arithmetic, well, if Frege was right about the relationship that he claimed between arithmetic and logic, the problem of Goldbach's conjecture is at base a logical problem. So you can't, but you couldn't believe that logic's trivial, that arithmetic's part of logic, and that Goldbach's conjecture is non-trivial. That's a, an inconsistent triad, right? There has to be. Either it's all trivial or it's not, or logic or arithmetic just isn't part of logic. And what would trivial mean in that context? If you thought Goldbach's conjecture was trivial, what, what would that mean? Could mean various things. One thing it could mean is you can decide it by computer in a finite amount of time. Mm -hmm. And of course, it, we don't know. It could be that Goldbach's conjecture is decidable by computer in a finite amount of time because. It could be that a computer could discuss it, discover a proof of it from the axioms of piano arithmetic, or it could be that a computer could discover a counterexample, right? Mm -hmm. If, in fact, Goldbach's conjecture is false, then a computer might be able to show that. Goldbach's conjecture has been checked by a computer for all even numbers up to about 10 to the power of, I don't know what it is now, 10 to the power of 10 or something, you know. It's been checked for a lot of cases, and no counterexample has so far been found, but you know, tomorrow we, we might read in the newspaper that a counter example has been found to Goldbach's conjecture. Mm, mm. I don't know. Yeah, so by trivial, you're not meant that it's unimportant or doesn't matter or you can take your pick. There's a very sort of technical... That's a separate issue. issue. I mean, whether you're interested in Goldbach's conjecture is a completely different question. Yeah, exactly. Um, of course, using logical notation, we can write down lots and lots and lots and lots of arithmetical sentences some of which mathematicians regard as really interesting and are willing to devote time to trying to settle, like Fermat's last theorem, famously. Others, mathematicians show absolutely no interest in whatsoever. And it's a separate question why that should be, why mathematicians have that aesthetic sense, if it is an aesthetic sense of which questions are interesting. But yeah, so interesting isn't the same as non-trivial in this sense. Non-trivial is about techniques for solving. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, um, in whatever time we have available, can you sort of tell us why um, Bagrisha's section nine, which, as you said, you think is the most important paragraph in philosophy or something of that sort. Um, what is it that section nine says that was so revolutionary? And this is in Bagrisha of 1879. Yeah. There's a paragraph in section nine of a Grifschrift where Frege expresses the idea of being able, once you've got a sentence that expresses a complete thought, 
so a declarative sentence like you know it's raining outside now or like john loves mary or um you know um socrates was a philosopher any of these declarative sentences once you've got a declarative sentence frege said you can detect in that sentence certain kinds of complexity and he said there can be various kinds of ways of decomposing a sentence once you've got it in front of you that can expose complexity in different ways and it's this paragraph in Begrishrif where he expresses that that I think is so revolutionary because what Frege is doing is he's trying to explain how this his notation works to be able to link remember we're going back to what we we're talking about earlier to link the place where the predication happens in a sentence to the place where the quantifier occurs in the sentence and what Frege uses to do that linkage is letters that that the, the letters which mathematicians call variables typically x y z mm -hmm. so the idea is the sentence which earlier we expressed as every man is such that some teacher is such that the former respects the latter well frege didn't use the words former and latter he used x and y so frege's way of expressing it would be every man x is such that some teacher y is such that x respects y so the x and the y there are notations to link the quantifiers to the argument places and this paragraph in section nine is where frege explains how you get the x's and y's the answer is you start with a sentence which doesn't have any quantifiers in it a sentence like um john respects mary then you remove part of that sentence and replace the part you've removed with a letter the, the, the only job of which is to mark that there's a gap there and what kind of gap it is. And you can remove more than one bit from the sentence, and each bit you remove, you can replace with a letter and use different letters to mark the order in which you're removing bits of the sentence. So in John Respects Mary, you remove John plug in an X to get X respects Mary. Then you, you say, oh, Mary, that, that's the other bit I want to remove. So you remove Mary, replace Mary with a variable, so you get X respects Y. Or you could remove respects. You could keep John and Mary and say, John F's Mary, where F is just another variable to be used for a, a verb position rather than a name position. So there is all these different ways of removing parts from a sentence. So what Frege was signaling was that in human language, sentence structure contains a remarkable amount of possibility for complexity. So you just say a sentence like John respects Mary looks like a very simple sentence subject verb object and yet Frege is showing you how there are multiple ways of decomposing John respects Mary into bits and once you've decomposed it in these different ways you can put quantifiers on on at the front and the key point is that this process can be iterated so you remove one bit of John respects Mary. You remove John to get the sum X such that X respects Mary. Then replace Mary with a Y. So you get every Y is such that sum X is such that X respects Mary. Right? So you keep going. And it's that that makes Phrygian quantified logic, so-called polyadic logic, 
so much more complex that, than Aristotelian syllogistic. And that's what explains this remarkable result, the church turing result that we mentioned earlier. So this one paragraph in section nine of Griffith, I'm suggesting encapsulates this idea of what's called function argument complexity, which explains so much about the complexity of logic. So that's why it's, I think, such a pregnant, pregnant paragraph. It's, it captures in one short paragraph the idea of removing parts of a sentence in order to detect kinds of complexity in that sentence in such a way that you can then generate new sentences with further kinds of complexity and then further kinds of complexity still all from one ostensibly simple sentence john respects mary that's very interesting i'm going to ask you a really naive question so uh if, if listen to what you said so far it sounds so there before frege you're talking about stoic and aristotelian logic with the main traditions now obviously that's a long time ago it's two thousand years plus before Frege's writing. And you'd mentioned that there are medieval logicians who were maybe circling around some of the ideas that Frege had. But then you just said that the, this one paragraph was so significant and what you described doesn't, on the face of it, seem that complicated, at least from where we sit now. Just that we can take a sentence of John loves Mary and think, well, it wouldn't have to be John, it wouldn't have to be Mary, it could be any two people have this relationship of respect. Um, and then we could apply that same idea of respecting to saying what well, everybody respects or somebody respects. So that doesn't seem that um, odd. And yet it's, it took almost well two, two and a half thousand years to sort of hit on it. And, and then Frege did. And you'd even mentioned there may have been a person in America who was closing in on it. What was it about Frege or the timing that suddenly made this transition possible that wasn't the case before? That's an, a really interesting question to which I don't know the answer. Why are some ideas missed for a long period? Why do they suddenly get spotted? Why is it that there really is this phenomenon? There are lots of cases, aren't there, of ideas which no one has for a long time. And then two people have them apparently independently in different places. Within a you know within a few years of each other, theory of evolution like that too. Isn't yeah, it? You know, ideas that just seem to be somehow in the air. Um, that's a big issue in the history of ideas that I just don't know about in general. And in this particular case, um, yeah, why didn't any of the medievals quite get to quantifier and variable? Because they had quantifiers in the medieval period. They had letters to express generality. Aristotle uses letters to express generality. You know, Aristotle has the idea of all A's are B's, all B's are C's. You know, he's he's using letters to express generality. Um, so that idea isn't new. And mathematicians were using variables centuries before, you know, in, in algebra for centuries before Frege. So the idea of how variables work in mathematics what wasn't new. And mathematicians by the late 19th century were expressing quite complicated, what we would now call quantifier variable expressions. So when you're doing calculus, proving things about the way that functions of a real variable operate, notions like continuity, which by the late 19th century was pretty well understood by people like Warstrass, um, who had been developing his lectures a few years before Frege. I mean, they were using quantifier and variable. They just weren't calling it quantifier and variable. You know, they were using the idea um, mm -hmm. and, and using quite sophisticated things about the order in which quantifiers occur in sentences to make important mathematical distinctions. So there's all that stuff happening um, just before Frege. Um, so why it didn't happen 50 years earlier or 100 years earlier or 500 years earlier, I don't know. Well, sometimes I think that could be the mark of genius, though, isn't it? That, that 
um, that they saw something that nobody had done for a long time before and yet now seems so obvious um, that uh, it seems almost bizarre. And, and but, but sometimes it seems so obvious to us because their discovery was so revolutionary and then just became sort of almost undeniable. Um, sometimes it takes a genius to point out the obvious. Do you, do you think? I think also it's very salutary to read other people screwing things up. In order to see the genius of someone like Frege, I mentioned earlier Russell. Read some of the stuff Russell writes in the Principles of Mathematics about the basics of logic. So, for example, here's one example. Russell thought that the proposition expressed by Socrates is mortal um, contains Socrates himself. That's the Rossinian conceptual proposition. So when Russell read, he actually mainly read this in Piano rather than in Frege. He read Piano being a, an Italian contemporary. Um, Russell had read about quantifier variable notation in Piano. So Russell wants to explain the notion, the difference between Socrates is mortal and X is mortal. Well, if Socrates is mortal, the proposition contains Socrates. Russell thought, therefore, what X is mortal expresses has to contain X, where by X, he doesn't mean the letter X. He means what it is that the letter X refers to. So Russell has this hugely inflated logical ontology where there are things called variables, not right. letters, but the letter X refers to the thing, the platonic variable X. Hmm. Now, I think that idea doesn't isn't very useful. I don't think we need to posit abstract entities called variables. And therefore, I think Frege got it right. What's impressive is Frege gets it right first time. Frege says, look, X and Y here, they're just letters. Indeed, Frege didn't like calling those letters variables because he thought that might induce you to think that there were entities out there that varied in some way. Mm -hmm. So Frege wants to resist that. That's why he prefers just to call them let letters, or italic yeah. letters, or, you know. And actually, when you look closely at his notation, he has two different types of letters, doesn't he? One to represent yeah. sort of a gap to fill and then another when it's in the scope of quantifier yeah. so yeah. he's i mean you definitely get that sense when you're reading even in Brigrishrift as you've talked about he was aware of some of these philosophical issues and the metaphysical impact of them and and how any of those philosophically important distinctions should be um, somehow represented in the notation what we're going to do next time is we're going to look at Grunlagen, which is the Foundations of Arithmetic, where, which is a very philosophical work. Uh, it's less technical. Frege is asking questions about what is number, um, what kind of thing do we do when we do arithmetic, uh, what, 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 how it relates to logic, um, and introduces a lot of other very important philosophical concepts like uh, sort of concepts and things like that as we go through. So it's going to be very, very interesting. We have decided to spend the entire time just talking about that work. And this is also a work before the sense reference distinction comes in. So you may not be so aware of Frege's thought before he makes that distinction unless you've looked at him at a slightly more advanced level. So all of that to look forward to. And uh, so thank you once again, Professor Botter, for joining us, and we'll speak to you again soon. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.